Well, well let me ask you to, um, can, we, can we give the uh, Williams Institute binder? I'm going to ask you to look at a binder of exhibits. And while that's being handed out to you, uh, uh, let me just ask you, uh, are you familiar with the Williams Institute? Yes, I am. And uh, when did you become familiar with the Williams Institute? Uh, several years ago, it's at UCLA. Now, you just answered my next question, which was, uh, where was the Williams Institute? It's at UCLA. UCLA, yes. Yes. And uh, what does the Williams Institute do? Uh, I know it promotes research on issues pertaining to gays and lesbians and providing, it provides funding for research in that area. There may have, you know, other parts of its mission, but that's the one that I'm the most familiar with. Well, let me ask you to look at tab B which is uh, Plaintiff's Exhibit 604. Tab what? Tab B, as in boy. This is in the new binder that was handed out. Very well. And this is testimony given by R. Bradley Sears, September 23, 2009, to the Committee on Education and Labor of the United States House of Representatives, which I would ask the court to take judicial notice of. No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Have you reviewed this testimony, sir? No, I'm not. Do you know who R. Bradley Sears is? I'm not familiar with him, no. All right, well, let me ask you to turn to the very last page and the last paragraph. After having talked about various research that the Williams Institute has done, it says, based on this research, as well as research I have just discovered, we conclude, one, there is widespread and persistent pattern of unconstitutional discrimination against LGBT state government of employees as well as local government employees. Two, there is no meaningful difference in the, in the pattern and scope of employment discrimination against LGBT people by state governments compared to what is found in the private sector or in federal or local governments. And three, the list of documented examples that we have compiled far underrepresents the actual prevalence of employment discrimination against the LGBT people by state and local governments. Now, do you have any reason to disagree with any of those conclusions? Having not done any research in this area, I don't have any basis for disagreeing with those conclusions. All right, let me ask you to look at uh, uh, behind tab C, Plaintiff's Exhibit 605. And uh, this is the beginning of the report that Mr. Sears referred to, and I would ask the court to take judicial notice of Plaintiff's Exhibit 605. No objection, Your Honor. No, very well. Mm -hmm. And you see at the bottom of this first page, uh, it essentially repeats what Mr. Sears had told Congress. Do you see that? It seems to be substantially the same, at least, yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever reviewed this at all? No, I've not. Well, then let me ask you to look at page two and the second bold headline where it says, courts and legal scholars have concluded that sexual orientation is not related to an individual's ability to contribute to society or perform in the workplace. Do you see that? I see that sentence, yeah. yes. Do you agree with that conclusion, sir? Objection, Your Honor. This is beyond the scope of the witness's expertise. He's a political scientist. Uh, Your Honor, here I, uh, I don't think that the objection is well taken. One of the issues here is that he says that discrimination is an element of political power. Now, one of the elements of discrimination is if you're treated differently, even though you're capable of performing the same task. That is, different treatment of like people is the best way to prove discrimination. And the first element of that is to prove they are like people. Well, like so many of the documents that have been shown to those who provided expert testimony in this case, I think that's very much of the same vein. It is a statement being used in order to obtain the reaction of the witness to the statement, and I think it's an appropriate line of inquiry. And therefore, the court having taken judicial notice of the document, I, I think the line of inquiry is an appropriate one, and the objection will be overruled. Um, do you have the question in mind, sir? I do. <clears throat> I haven't looked closely to see if there are any examples where sexual orientation would be a factor in terms of the workplace. I can't think of any. So 
in general, I think I would not have any objection to this statement. Mm -hmm. And this is the first chapter of the, oh, let me ask you to look next, uh, tab D. Uh, yeah, you mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. This is the, the Williams Report, first chapter. Yes. And we have marked each chapter with a separate exhibit number, you see? Mm. But I would ask the court to take judicial notice at this time of plaintiff's exhibit uh, 606, 607, 608, 609, 610, 611, 612, 613, 614, 615, 616. 616? Six, yes, 616, 617, 618, 619, and 620, which are the 15 chapters of the Williams Institute report, the introduction of which has, have, has already uh, been taken judicial notice of. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, and that included 608. That was one of the ones you mentioned? Uh, yes, it was, Your Honor. I, I, I think it was 608 through 620. Very well. You may proceed. Now, um, have you reviewed any portion of this report prior to today, sir? Uh, I'm sorry, how far does it go to which tab? Uh, it goes through tab R, as in Robert. No, I, I don't believe I have seen any of these before today. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let me ask you to turn to tab Q, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 619. And the second paragraph on the first page? Yes. After talking about how the United States Supreme Court has recognized irrational discrimination as often signal signaled by indicators of bias, and talking about unsubstantiated factors as not being a permissible basis for government decision making, the report says, quote, this concern has special ability, applicability to widespread and persistent negative attitudes towards gay and transgender minorities. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, do you have any reason to disagree with the report that there is widespread and persistent negative attitudes towards gay and transgender minorities? Just reading the paragraph again. Yeah, it's probably fair to say that that's true. Although I would add a caveat that I, I think both of those terms, uh, widespread and persistent, are especially widespread, is declining over time. But it is still, I mean, as of the date of the report, which I think was 2009, it was still widespread and persistent, correct? Yeah, I, I think there is a scale of widespread and a scale of persistent, and it used to be worse, and it's not as bad now. Now, if you compare the political power of gays and lesbians today with the political power of African Americans, which minority do you think has greater political power? African Americans today? Yes. Okay. Comparing gays and lesbians today with African Americans today, I'm asking you which of those two minorities has a greater political power in your opinion? Well, are you asking in California or nationally? Well, because the answer might be somewhat different. Then let me ask both questions. First, nationally. Which minority has a greater political power nationally? Uh, okay, I think <clears throat> it's somewhat difficult to make these comparisons because we don't know. Uh, we haven't defined what we mean by po political power. But oh, I thought that's what you were testifying about, sir. Okay, well, I haven't heard your question. So I, I do have a view of it, which is what I said, which is the attention to attract, the ability to attract the attention of lawmakers, yes. Now, using political power the way you have defined it, nationally, do you believe that the African-American minority or the gay and lesbian minority has the greater political power? Well, again, that's somewhat difficult to say. I well, mean, the answer I would could say be yes. No, or I don't know. I would have to say I don't know to okay. that. Okay. I Good. would have to think about it more. Good. Now let me ask you the same question in California. Do you believe that in California the African American community a minority or the gay and lesbian minority has the greater political power? I would say compared to the national level. No, no, I'm not, I'm not asking compared to the national level. I'm talking about 
California, okay? In California today, you've got a gay and lesbian minority, and you've got an African-American minority, right? That's correct. Now, I'm asking you in California, because you brought it up. Yes, I did. Which one of these two minorities has a greater political power? I think it's a closer call. Uh, it's a closer call in California. Now, that, that, does that mean you don't know, but you are closer to knowing? <laughs> um, uh, I, I just don't know what you mean by closer call. I'm asking you about California. Yes. And again, the answer might be the African-American community. The answer, I suppose, could be the gay and lesbian community. Or the answer could just be, I don't know. Well, I think that it's a, it's a complex analysis, and I can't really make a judgment on it one way or the other. Because you haven't made that analysis thus far. Is that fair? Well, I have made an analysis about the gay and lesbian community. I haven't done as extensive an analysis of the African-American community, either nationally or at the local level in California. So it's difficult. It's difficult to make a comparison without having the same level of analysis of the two. As I understand it, what you are saying is that you would need more time to do more of an analysis before you could answer my question as to whether the gay and lesbian community or the African American community has more political power in the state of California. Is that right? I would need to do more analysis of the African American community, the ability of resources that they have to bring to bear the political process. And you haven't done that, is that right? I think I could say they are not powerless. Uh, that's clearly true. And they have got you know, political power both in California and the United States. The African-American people. Yes, they do, as well as gay and lesbian community. Well, yes, and, and I understand and I appreciate your testimony that the African-American community has political power, both nationally and in California. Now, you have also said in your opinion that the gay and lesbian communica uh, community has political power, both nationally and in California. That's correct? That's correct. All right. I just want to close this off. What I was asking you was to compare the political power of the African-American minority with the gay and lesbian minority. And I believe you told me you couldn't do that nationally. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, it's also the case that you cannot do that in California. Is that right? I would be hesitant to make a conclusion one way or the other on that, yes. And is it fair to say that you think you have done enough work on the gay and lesbian community to answer this question if you would uh, uh, had done a comparable amount of work on the African-American community? I think probably so. All right. Now, in terms of what you teach and the research that you have done, and I'm not talking about your testimony here, but I'm talking about your work academically. You focused more on the African-American minority than you have on the gay and lesbian minority, correct? In my academic work before this case, I think it's probably fair to say. Uh, although I haven't really dealt with ballot measures or um, analyzed ballot mm. measures in as great a detail as I have with respect to gays and lesbians. Now, despite all of the allies that you say the gay and lesbian community has, they were unable to pass Proposition 8. No, they were able. To, they were able to defeat. They were able to defeat Proposition Eight or Proposition Twenty Two. Correct. Yes, and I'm glad I'm not the only one who mixes it up. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. What? I'm glad I'm not the only one who mixes that up. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was thinking about all that power that they have, and I, I was almost, I was almost believing that it had failed earlier. Uh, okay. Now, you have actually written about why minorities who have a lot of political allies, nevertheless suffer defeats in the initiative process, correct? I don't know if I phrased it quite in that way. Well, let's try to phrase it in your language. And, and in that connection, put aside the Williams book so we don't have too much uh, stuff. May I approach, Your Honor? Yes, you may. All right, and let me give you the third volume of our cross binder. You have the volume? It's uh, the third volume. And the tabs begin at 78. Yes. Now, I would like to ask you to look at tab 90, which is Plaintiff's Exhibit 2865. OK. And can you identify what that is? Uh, this is an article I wrote for a journal called American Politics Research. Mm -hmm. And when did you write it? It was shortly after the recall election of Governor Gray Davis. So. The recall was 2003. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just shortly after that. All right. And if you turn to the second page, well, it's on the first page as well. Right under the title and your name, do you see it says American Politics Research 2005? 
Uh, I see at the bottom it says to March 2005. Um, so, oh, I see. Oh, no, I see. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the next page, 135. Well, you are more precise. It was March 2005, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's, that's when it was published, yeah. Uh, it was probably written several months before that. All right, let me ask you to look at page 138 and the second sentence of the first full paragraph. Uh, it's the paragraph that's right above the paragraph that begins by contrast. Do you see that? I see the first full paragraph uh, of these three types. Is that where it begins? Yeah, and, and then the next sentence, uh, the sentence that reads, sometimes called lawmaking without government, broader 2000, the initiative process, radically departs from the Madisonian system of delegation and checks and balances by substituting unfiltered direct democratic rule. You see that? Yeah, I do. And that's what you wrote in late 2004 or, or whenever you were writing this uh, March 2005 article, correct? Well, again, uh, I think it was shortly <clears throat> after the recall election, which was in 2003, and I can't remember. I mean, it would have been sometime in 2004 probably when I wrote this. So, and the answer to that question is yes. I mean, I wrote it at that time. Now, you mentioned you were a lawyer and you had published at least one article in a law review, correct? Correct. Uh, let me ask you to turn to tab 35 in Plaintiff's Exhibit 1869, please. And while he's doing that, Your Honor, I would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 2865. No objection, Your Honor. 2865 is admitted. And this is tab 35 in Binder. Uh, in our Miller book. I beg your pardon? That's volume one. Volume two. What? Did you say tab? No, it's volume two. It's volume two. <clears throat> Tell me, wouldn't it be a good time to take a break? Well, this would be a good time to take a break. All right, we'll do that. Ten minutes, counsel. Be back if you can. Make it ten minutes of the hour. Very well, Mr. Boys, you may continue your examination of Dr. Miller. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, sir, uh, I directed the witness attention to tab 35, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1869, and this is an article that you wrote, and it was published in the Santa Clara Law Review in 2001. Yes. I would offer this, Your Honor. No objection, Your Honor. Very well, Plaintiff's 1869 is admitted. And let me ask you to look at page nine of this article. Yes. Now, the second full paragraph, the first sentence reads, moreover, by limiting the opportunities for opponents and other interested parties to participate in the process, the initiative system makes compromise and consensus building less necessary than in legislature. You see that? Yes. And you wrote that, did you not? I did. And obviously you believed it at the time, correct? That was my interpretation of it at the time, yes. Do you agree with that today? I still believe that's a fair statement, yes. All right, let me ask you to look at the last sentence of paragraph of the paragraph, and that really deals with the same subject matter. It says, uh, in allowing proponents to eschew compromise and accommodation of competing interest, the initiative, initiative process fosters polarization rather than consensus building. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And you wrote that at the time, correct? Yes, I did. And you believed it at the time, correct? Yes, I did. Do you believe it now? I think I would probably write it somewhat differently now. Well, that may always be true, but uh, the question is, is whether you believe it now to be true or not. More or less, yes. All right, let me ask you to look next at page six. And the last full sentence reads, thus, in California, both initiative constitutional amendments and initiative statutes undermine the authority and flexibility of representative government. Do you see that? Yes. And what did you mean there by representative government? I would probably have to go back and look at it a little bit. But in general, what I meant at this time was that initiatives have the tendency, uh, not always the case, but have the tendency of making it more difficult for the legislature to do its job. Uh, for example, by locking in spending mandates or other things. Uh, and so I think that's a fair characterization of my views on this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you to look next at tab 82, which is in the third volume. 
Now this was a chapter that you and Professor Bruce Kane wrote, and the chapter was entitled, The Populist Legacy, Initiatives and Undermining of Representative Government. And uh, that was published in a book titled, uh, Dangerous Democracy, The Battle Over Ballot Initiatives in America. Is that correct? That's correct, and I believe it was published in 2001, uh, about the same time as the Santa Clara article. All right, and let me direct your attention to the bottom of page 33. In the last full sentence, it reads, we discuss how ironically direct testimony can actually be less democratic than representative democracy. Counsel, you best read it. It's I'm sorry. We discuss how ironically direct democracy can actually be less democratic than representative democracy in that it fails to maximize democratic opportunities for refinement, informed liberation, uh, consensus building, and compromise, and violates democratic norms of openness, accountability, competence, and fairness. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, you were referring to direct democracy. Uh, were, you, were you referring to initiatives? Yes, uh, this was my, uh, this is what I call the Madisonian critique of the initiative process. All right, and let's go to page 41. I assume you are moving in 2857? Yes, Your Honor, I am. I would offer Exhibit 2857. No objection. 2857 <clears throat> is admitted. Uh, let me turn to page 41, the last paragraph at the bottom of the page. It begins, the direct democracy mechanic mechanisms that pose the greatest challenge to representative government are the forms of the popular initiative. Do you see that? Yes. And going to the last full sentence on that page, you write, initiative constitutional amendments, ICAs, most seriously undermine representative government because they can only be altered by another constitutional amendment. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And those obviously represented your views at the time, correct? Yes. Uh, when I say undermined representative government, the same way uh, as I did in my prior answer. Well, and defining undermining representative government the same way you defined it in your prior answer, yes. you still believe this is an accurate statement. I don't think it's always the case. No. I mean, I think it can be. And so this doesn't s sort of clarify how frequently this occurs, but I think it can be the case, yes. Well, I, and indeed, I don't think you say here that it's always the case. No, I don't. But it's true that an initiative constitutional amendment can only be altered by another constitutional amendment. I mean, it, it could be put on the ballot by the legislature, not by initiative. But it would still have to be passed by the people, correct? I, uh, if we're talking about California, yes yes, 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 yes. And let me ask you to turn to page 43. And let me ask you to look at paragraph that begins under the heading, Undermining Democratic Opportunities. Yes. You write, a well-functioning democratic system provides opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. Legislative procedures tend to maximize these opportunities, whereas initiative processes, by its nature, undermines them. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And obviously, you believed that the time that you wrote it, right? Yes, I did. And does that reflect your current views? Uh, I think there are certain circumstances in which deliberation can occur in the initiative process in various ways. Uh, as I have done more research on the initiative process, I've had I um, would modify these in certain respects, this, well, that particular sentence. Well, what you're saying is that in some cases there could be opportunities for compromise in the initiative process? Is that what you're saying? I think I said informed deliberation to compromise and consensus building, uh -huh. uh, all of these things. There's certainly opportunities in the initiative process, yes. Now, sir, you have studied a lot of initiatives. Yes, I have. Uh, 900, more than 900. All right. Now, of those 900-plus initiatives, and how many of those initiatives were there what you would call, uh, referred to as refinements, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise? Well, it's difficult to say because what I have looked at is the outcome of the initiative as opposed to really the, the formation of it. But I do know that under certain circumstances, <clears throat> there are opportunities where the proponents of initiatives will be forming a coalition, for example, among various different groups 
to put the ballot measure on the ballot. So oftentimes there's compromise that goes in uh, on the formation at the proponent stage. Mm -hmm. So I just don't want to leave the impression that this is always the case. I mean, the point is that the legislative process builds in these things. In the initiative process, it can happen, but it, it doesn't always happen. And can you give me any indication based on your study of the 900 plus initiatives, how many times it has happened in history where there has been significant informed deliberation, consensus building, compromise in the formation of an in initiative? I can only give anecdotal examples. Well, how many examples can you give? I don't know today. As you sit here now. Uh, do, do you want to do a few? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm asking you how many. I don't know. Approximately how many. Uh, I'd have to think about it. I mean, maybe three or four, or five, I don't know. Okay. Uh, that's without any serious investigation of the, uh, you know, the, the, the drafting process of these measures. So what you are saying is that you have not done any serious investigation of how these 900 initiatives were drafted and came to be put on the ballot. Yeah, or even really uh, the campaigns for the most part. It's because I, I'm doing a very large study. Uh, I, I'm more looking at more of the outcomes of initiatives than what happens to them after the, uh, after the election. Uh, would you agree that in a legislature and uh, legislative procedures, you have these opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise? And, and, and what you are saying is that it could occur or could not occur in the initiative process, depending on what people did. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think I should, I should also amend the first part of your statement a little bit because this provides a somewhat idealized picture of the legislation, legislature. I mean, I, rather, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that, that legislatures don't always provide all of those four opportunities, or I mean, they don't always live up to that ideal of providing opportunities for refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. Well, there's no doubt that there are more opportunities in the legislature than in the initiative process, correct? There's a lot more. Yeah. There's a lot more opportunities for what you refer to here as refinement, informed deliberation, consensus building, and compromise. You are not disagreeing that there are more opportunities for that in the legislature. Well, the, uh, the institutional structure of the legislature is set up for those four things. I mean, that's why I wrote that. Yes. And the initiative process is not as structured in that way. All right. And if there's going to be any compromise or refinement or informed deliberation in the initiative process, it's going to be in the formation of the proposal, correct? Because once it's out there, it can't be amended, right? In terms of deliberation, uh, a lot of deliberation happens during the campaign stage of the, uh, um, among the That's voters. a yes or no, correct? Voters can vote uh, yes or no on the proposition, right? That's correct. Uh huh. They can't amend it. They can't modify it. They can't refine it. Correct? In California, at least, there is no opportunity. Uh, once the proponents put it out for signature, there is no opportunity to amend the initiative. Uh, the only thing they can do is is pull it back and redraft it, and then recirculate it. And how many times has that happened in the 900 in initiatives that you looked at? Well, in some states, it happens a lot. In, in Oregon, California, it, uh, how often has that happened? Not infrequently. When was the last time it happened? Where they put it, pulled it back, they made a compromise, and then they put it back out again. The last time it happened in California. I guess. I'm not asking last you year. to guess, sir. I'm asking you to tell me. I can't tell you the specific initiative, but I know it's a frequent thing. If, if, if you go to the Secretary of State's website, they have different versions of a, of a particular proposal, and the proponents are trying to figure out what's the best version of the proposal that they threw out. Uh, they put out different versions so that they have discussions among themselves. So it's a frequent, it's, I would say in California, it's frequent. I can't give you a number of times it's happened. All right, when was the last time that you know of where an initiative was drafted, signatures were collected, it was put out there, and then the proponents pulled it back because they wanted to modify it or, or put something else out there? Uh, I'm trying to think of the special election in 2005. This was something along those lines, but I think they actually did not pull it back or there was discussion about it yet. Well, what I'm asking is when did they pull it back, okay? That, that, that just doesn't happen in California, does it? In terms of the uh, 
Uh, well, once it gets on the ballot. Yeah, it, once they start circulating that petition. No, I think it does happen. Well, okay, when did it happen? When did it last happen? I can't tell you. Approximately. I don't know. Give me any example that you can remember from your research when it happened in California. As I said, I Just can't tell you. Just one example. I'm more familiar in Colorado and But we're some talking other about California, sir. I'm trying to talk about California. You said you wanted to talk about California, so we're talking about California. Now give me an example, if you have one. Your Honor, he's badgering the witness. It's been asked and answered many times. Objection overruled. It's cross-examination. Now, if you don't have one, sir, if you don't have an example... I don't have an example Okay, that I can okay. Give well, you. then let me go back to the chapter you wrote with Professor Kane. For the record, who was Professor Kane? It's Professor Bruce Kane uh, is a professor at the University of California at Berkeley. And he's a well-regarded scholar in this area. I believe so, yes. And let me ask you to look at page 45. And you have a heading there that says, violating democratic norms. You see that? Yes. And the first sentence says, the actual operation of the initiative process violates a number of norms that have evolved in advanced democracies. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Now, what were the norms that you were referring to there? Well, I'm trying to get the context here. Well, I think it's the norms. I, mean, I think, that I think I, I, what, what norms were you referring to? Well, I think it's the norms that are listed in the succeeding paragraphs. And those are the norms of openness, accountability, and competence, and fairness. Is that right? That's right. All right, let me ask you to go back and look at your Santa Clara Law Review article. Can you remind me where that's at? Tab 35. And the first full paragraph, the first sentence. Of which page? On page 10. Of page 10, uh, the first full paragraph beginning in sum? Yes. Mm. And the first sentence here that reads, in sum, it is ironic that initiatives have this reputation of being a more pure form of democracy when the process undermines democratic opportunities and violates procedural guarantees observed by almost every freely elected legislature in the world. Now, what were the democratic opportunities and procedural guarantees that you were referring to here, sir? I think <clears throat> with respect to the opportunities, it was what we were describing in terms much consensus building, compromise, deliberation, those types of things. And what about procedural guarantees? What were you referring to there? I I'm not sure. Uh, the things like openness that you just asked about? Right, the four norms we, that we just talked about. Four norms, right. yes. Right, now let me ask you to turn to page, uh, to turn to tab 89, which is exhibit 2864. And this was an amicus brief of William Eastrich and Bruce Kane to the Supreme Court of California in connection with that court's consideration of Proposition 8. First, Mr. Eastrich here is the professor that you have identified that was an expert in the field, correct? Well, when we were talking about writers who do LGBT rights issues? Right, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, that was and, the one. And Bruce Kane is the professor that you identified as an expert in political science and initiatives, correct? Yeah. Uh, he would be considered an expert in those fields. I want to, uh, uh, Your Honor, uh, I would ask that you take judicial notice of this brief. No objection. Very well, 2864 is noted and will be admitted for that purpose. All right. First, let me ask you to look at page 4, footnote 2. It says, at present, 30 states have state constitutional bars to marriage for same-sex couples all of them adopted by popular initiatives. Do you see that? Yes. Now, can you confirm that from your own knowledge, sir? I believe that's an incorrect statement. That is an incorrect statement. Yes. All right. How many states have constitutional bars to same-sex marriage as you understand it? Uh, I believe it's about that number, 30 or so. About 30? About 30. And how many of those have been adopted by popular initiatives? I believe it's... Ten? Something in the neighborhood of that? Ten. I believe it's ten. Uh -huh. And how were the other 20 adopted? Well, I might not have the numbers exactly right, uh, ten and, and 20, but I think most of them were adopted by the legislature putting a constitutional amendment on the ballot <clears throat> and the voters approving the amendment, uh, the DOMA amendment. Um, there are not 30 states in the United States that have 
in the initiative process. Right, let me understand if I let me see if I understand what you're saying. You're saying that the 30 states, you're saying that the 30 states have constitutional bars to same-sex marriage. You're saying that. Do you agree with that part? Uh, yeah, I do agree with that part. Now, what you are saying, you are saying is that uh, they weren't adopted by popular initiatives. First, all of these 30 state constitutional bars were presented to the people for a vote. Do you agree with that? That's correct. Uh, that's typically true of states, that in order to amend the Constitution, you need a popular vote. And would you agree that every time the issue of whether to permit or bar same-sex marriage has been presented to a popular vote, the result has been a bar on same-sex marriage? No. You would not agree with that? No, I would not. Okay. When was there a different result? I'm forgetting the year, but it was in Arizona. What happened there? The voters, uh, they defeated a DOMA amendment. And Arizona doesn't have same-sex marriage, correct? No, it does not. And what are you saying was defeated? Uh, there was an initiative put on the ballot by citizens, uh, an initiative constitutional amendment, and it was, it would, um, it would have limited marriage to between a man and a woman, and I think it maybe had some other provisions, and it was defeated by the voters in a general election. Is there any other example that you have? I believe in Colorado, uh, there were a couple of options, and the voters approved one and rejected the other. I mean, all those are the only. Wait, wait, ones. Is, are you talking about number about Colorado number two? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, I'm talking uh, about a marriage amendment in Colorado. I think they're they are on the same ballot though, so it's it's a different situation than Arizona. No, I want to get your testimony in Colorado, where the voters presented with a question of whether or not to permit same-sex marriage. Yes, they were. And what was that vote? I believe it... Uh, to permit or not permit it? It was to not permit. Okay, now let me take Arizona, okay? Yeah. Is Arizona the only example where you have the voters voted not to bar same-sex marriage? As I said, Arizona voters voted not to bar same-sex marriage. My question to you, sir... Let me finish the answer. In Colorado, I believe there were two options, and the voters rejected one, and they adopted the other. But in Colorado, you already said the voters voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes, they did. Okay, now what I'm asking you about was any state that voted not to bar same-sex marriage. Do you understand? Yeah. I. Well, can I you give me an example? Maybe the confusion in Colorado was there were two options. I mean, they voted no on one and yes on the other, okay? I mean, that's my understanding of the Colorado situation. Was, was that, that in Colorado, in Colo or, Colorado or Arizona? No. N no, it, it was in Arizona. Arizona in one year, and I'm forgetting the year of whether it was, I, I, I don't know, I think it was in 06. Um, they voted no on a state initiative constitutional amendment to limit marriage between a man and a woman. It was a close vote. Uh, the legislature then put a legislative constitutional amendment on the ballot. I believe that was in 08, and the voters approved that. The legislature did what? Uh, the, the legislature put a DOMA, a defense of marriage amendment, on the ballot, and the voters approved it in Arizona. I mean, that was following the rejection in the prior election cycle. Right. Let me just clarify that for the court, okay? First, we talked about Colorado and Arizona. Yes. All right. And we agreed that in Colorado, the voters voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes, they did. Okay. Now, in Arizona, the voters have now voted to bar same-sex marriage, correct? Yes. But they approved, they approved a legislative constitutional amendment that was put on the ballot by the legislature. And it passed. The people voted for it, right? The second time around, it passed. Yes. And so Arizona, it took two times, right? And I believe the text was different in the second time. But it still barred same-sex marriage, correct? That's the content of the second measure, yes. And are you aware of any state where, other than Arizona, any state where it took more than two times, or took more than one time, are you aware of any state other than Arizona where it took more than one time for the voters to bar same-sex marriage? No. No. All right, now let me ask you to look at tab 89. This is an amicus brief by Professor Estridge and Kane. And let me ask you in connection to look at page 11. And I want you to look at the first full paragraph. 
beginning proposition eight. Yes, yeah. and Professor Estridge and Kane here talk about hyperamendability. Do you see that? Yes. Now, is that a term you're familiar with? Uh, it's not a term that I use, but I think Bruce Kane has used that term before. Yes, I've seen that. And what does it mean? Well, I, uh, I believe his view is that it's, it's too easy for a state constitution to be amended. I haven't read this amicus brief, and so I'm not sure if that's exactly how he's using it, but that's my understanding of his view on this issue. All right. Now, he says, quote, Proposition 8 at issue in this case is an even more troubling example of hyperamendability. And Proposition 115, or perhaps even Proposition 14, at first, uh, oh, do you know what Proposition 115 and, 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 and Proposition 14 are, sir? Uh, yeah, 115 was called a victim's right initiative, if I'm recalling correctly. And Proposition 14, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of Proposition 14s. We repeat the numbers, but mm -hmm. I assume he's meaning the one from 1964, I believe. And that was where the people of California passed a proposition that overruled legislative rules that had been enacted prohibiting racial discrimination and property transactions, correct? That's correct. Right. Professor Eastridge and Kane then go on to say, in contrast to Proposition 115, which applied to all citizens who might in the future be charged with a crime, Proposition 8 takes away a fundamental constitutional right from just a minority. In contrast to Proposition 14, where the discrimination was found in the motivation of proponents, discrimination is on the face of proper Proposition 8. You see that? Yes, I do. First, do you agree that uh, the discrimination that is referred to here is on the face of Proposition 8? No, I don't. Didn't you give earlier an example of uh, laws prohibiting same-sex marriage as an example of discrimination against gays and lesbians? I believe I said it treated them differently. Well, and the record will show what it shows, but I think I was asking you for examples of discrimination. Is it your testimony that you think a law like Proposition 8 is not discrimination against gays and lesbians? Well, I think what it does is it establishes marriage as between a man and a woman. It has a, a different kind of, it, it excludes other uh, forms uh, of marriage. And my okay. question is this, and I think it can be answered by yes or no. You said it treats gays and lesbians differently, correct? You said that just a moment ago. Yeah, I mean, if same-sex couples want to marry under this law, they cannot do so. Right, now what I'm asking you is uh, whether that different treatment amounts to what you, as a political scientist, refer to as discrimination or not. Do you have an opinion? Well, to the extent that we are saying that different, uh, I mean, I say that it's differential treatment. Whether it's legally discrimination, I don't know. As I, a political I, scientist, not a lawyer, but as a political scientist, you studied discrimination, correct? Correct. And is it fair to say that the, in the area of political science that discrimination has an understanding and people know what they mean when they talk about discrimination? Well, there's, there's different definitions. I mean, there's, there's uh, invidious discrimination, there's discrimination is, is discerning between, you know, or, or choosing between two different things, making distinctions. I mean, that's, that's my understanding of discrimination. And some discrimination is permissible and others is not. And right now I'm not asking you to make a legal judgment as to whether there are, this discrimination is legal or not legal. I'm just saying it's clear that on the face of it there's discrimination, right? It makes a distinction between these two types of couples, yes. And under that definition, discrimination is discrimination. And just to tie that down, when you say under that definition, that is a definition that would be commonly used by political scientists. Is that fair? I don't know the answer to that. Well, it was at least used by Professor Estridge and Kane, correct? Yes. And those are very highly regarded scholars on the political science field, correct? 
Uh, I don't agree with their analysis here, but they are highly regarded. Now, no when doubt. you say you don't agree with their analysis, I, I thought you just told me that you didn't know whether the definition of discrimination that you just used was or was not something that was commonly used in political science. Didn't you just tell me that? Well, when I say I don't know that I agree with them, it's that whole paragraph that you read to me. I mean, there's a lot embedded in there that I don't agree with. Well, let me, let me just try and ask you to focus on the question that I'm asking you, sir. I'll try. They say that the discrimination in Proposition 8 is on the face of Proposition 8. That's what I'm talking about. And just so we don't have to go through all this again, right. you told me that Proposition 8, on its face, treated people differently. And under that definition of discrimination, there was discriminating against them. You told me that just a minute ago. It creates a distinction between the two groups, yes. Oh, sir, I think we're going backwards. What I was trying to do was to get you to tell me whether the definition of discrimination that you used in the answer when you said, under that definition of discrimination, it would be discrimination. And then I asked you then, is that commonly used by political scientists? And you said, I don't know. Well, I would say political scientists use a lot of different definitions of discrimination. So I don't know whether my definition, I'm, I mean, I, I think it's a dictionary, a dictionary definitions that draw distinctions is discrimination. So they, they would use that. I mean, they might have other means of discrimination depending on their research. This is, this is a very common scholarship that people define terms and they use them in various ways. Yes, and is there a definition that you have that would make Proposition 8 discrimination or not discrimination? Is there a definition you personally have as a political scientist, yes or no? Yes. Or I don't know. Well, okay, let me, let me try to move this forward, okay? My view is that Proposition 8 makes distinctions. Um, in that sense, it discriminates between these two different categories, makes a distinction in terms of discriminating. Uh, whether it's, you know, invidious discrimination, uh, that's, that's a different question. And Professor Eastrich and Kane don't address whether it's invidious or not in his... I, I think it's implied pretty clearly in there. He, here, it is implied that it's invidious? Uh, I believe so, yes. Uh, let me ask you to look at page 17 of this amicus brief. At the end of the last full sentence there, uh, they talk about class legislation that takes away a fundamental constitutional right from a minority that is traditionally and has been the object of prejudice and stereotyping. You see that? Uh, do you want to read the whole sentence once again? Sure. Let me read the whole paragraph. Okay. As this court recognized in remarriage cases, sexual orientation is a suspect classification for the same reason race and sex are, and marriage is a fundamental right for gay and lesbian couples, just as it is for interracial couples whose rights were protected in Perez v. Sharp. The, on the whole point of constitution, according to social contract theory, the founders of our nation and the terms of our state constitution is to entrench guarantees that all, emphasize all, citizens can count on. A natural reading of Article 18 in light these constitutional commitments is that higher hurdles must be surmounted before the voters can essentially add to the Constitution class legislation that takes away a fundamental constitutional right from a minority that has traditionally been the object of prejudice and stereotyping. Now, my question is whether you agree that gays and lesbians are a minority that has been traditionally been the object of prejudice and stereotyping as the professors here say. I think we're getting into the realm of history, Your Honor. I renew my objection. I think this takes, up it right, it takes it right up to the present, Your Honor. Okay, overruled. So gays and lesbians are a minority. They have been the object of prejudice and stereotyping in the past. As I indicated in my direct testimony, I believe that there has been a significant change in that in recent areas. Do you believe that gays and lesbians are still the object of prejudice and stereotyping today? 
I think, uh, like a lot of groups, they are, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, I think, like a lot of groups, they face some stereotyping and some prejudice. Today, you believe that gay and lesbians suffer more more as the object of prejudice and stereotyping than do, say, African Americans? Uh, I certainly think African Americans still face a lot of prejudice and stereotyping. Uh, again, mm -hmm. it's, it's a comparative analysis. It would be difficult for me to do so. And you have not done it? I have not done it. So you don't have an opinion on that today? That's correct. I don't. Well, do you believe that gays and lesbians today are more the object of prejudice and stereotyping than uh, women? Again, I think women still face a lot of prejudice and stereotyping, and I haven't done a comparative analysis, no. Now, Professor Miller, granted that women still face a, a large amount of prejudice and stereotyping, is it really your testimony that you can't tell whether they face more or less prejudice than stereotyping uh, and stereotyping than gays and lesbians? You can't tell? Well, I think I would have to look more closely at it, actually. Um, I think there's a lot of anti-female stereotyping in our society. Well, I'm today. not disputing that. I'm just pressing you on the idea that in our society today, women are or could be as much the object of prejudice and stereotyping as gay and lesbians. Again, I'd have to take a closer look at that. Um, I haven't done that comparative analysis. All right. Let me just leave the gays out of the equation for a moment. Let's just talk about the lesbians. Would you agree that lesbians face all of the prejudice and stereotyping of women, generally, plus more? That's a fair statement. So, at least with respect to lesbians, they've got to be more the object of prejudice and stereotyping than women, correct? Yeah, same thing. I'm sorry, what? I would have the same answer, yes. Yes. Okay, let me ask you to look at page 19. Four lines from the bottom, the sentence that begins, for example. Here, Professor Estrich and Kane say, the proponents of Proposition 8 centrally maintained that the state recognition of same-sex marriage would require, emphasize, require schools to teach vulnerable children that, quote, gay marriage, close quote, is just as good as traditional marriage. They claim that has no basis, and it is accepted by some voters. They claim that that, that, that claim has no basis, and, and its acceptance by some voters probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same rights as the straight majority, and, and, some, and some, no marriage right at all. Do you see that? I'm reading it, uh, one second. Okay, I see the sentence, yes. All right, now, now I, I take it, well, let me ask you. Do you have an opinion as to whether uh, what they say here is accurate or not? I assume that you don't, but, but if, I ju if, you, if you do, just tell Objection. me. Objection. Beyond the scope of direct, Your Honor, I didn't ask the witness about the campaign relating to Proposition 8. I think this line of testimony and inquiry does pursue the testimony that he gave on direct, and therefore the objection will be overruled. Do you have an opinion as to whether Professor Eastrich and Kane are correct when they say that claim has no basis and its acceptance by some of the voters probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majorities and, and, and having no large rights at all. Yes, I have an opinion. I'm sorry, what? Yes, I do have an opinion. And do you agree or disagree? Um, I think there is a basis with respect to this, you know, circular consequences of Proposition 8. And so, you know, the first clause, the claim has no basis, I don't agree with that. The second clause with regard to the impact of that, that message is it probably made the difference between the gay minorities having the same marriage rights as the straight majority and, and having no marriage rights at all. There's a lot embedded in that. First of all, in terms of the, of the <coughs> message's impact on the outcome of the election, I don't actually know. I'm sorry, what? I don't actually know. I don't. I, I mean, there are a lot of different messages going on in the campaign. Well, if you don't know, you don't know. Okay. All right. As you say, uh, they make two statements here. One is the claim that the state recognition of same-sex marriage would require schools to teach vulnerable children that gay marriage is as good as traditional marriage. They say that claim has no basis. You say, no, I disagree with that. Uh, I think that claim does have basis. I think it could be shown to have a basis, yes. 
could be shown to have a basis. Has anybody shown it to have a basis that you're aware of? I think the analysis that was done by the proponents of Proposition 8 with respect to existing California state education requirements in terms of the curriculum in the uh, public schools and what the potential impact of the passage of Proposition 8 would be had a basis. Uh, I don't know if it's actually correct or not. I mean, it hasn't been tested in the courts. I assume if Proposition 8 were passed and there was a you know, circular, uh, curricular move under existing state laws to make this happen, then there would be challenges to, to it. So I, I, I don't know whether it would actually have happened or not, but I think there was a basis for believing it could have happened. Yes. Okay. The second part is that the claim and, and its acceptance made the difference in the election or, or made the difference in the vote. And that's something you say you, you, don't, uh, you do not have opinion on, correct? Well, I'd say it w I would say that it's hard to say because there were, no, there were so many messages well, in this I'm campaign. Well, I'm not asking you why you don't have an opinion. I'm just asking you whether you have an opinion as to whether that's accurate or not. Uh, it said possibly, it possibly made the difference. Then I might be able to adopt that. If it probably made the difference, then I can't say. And definitely it made the difference which is what they say. You can't say that either, right? They say probably made the difference. Uh, yes, they do say probably. Yeah, so if they said definitely, then I would say I disagree with that. I, if they say probably, I don't know. Possibly, I would agree with that. All right, I just want to understand your logic. You said you didn't know whether it made a difference or not, right? You didn't know whether that was the difference in the election. And when I say the election, I mean the vote, right? The vote, right, yeah. Uh, it was a factor out there. There was a lot of other factors, and I can't, I, I, I haven't done any polling on this. I don't know anyone else who, who can say that, you know, message about the, uh, the curricular, uh, well, the potential curricular impact of Proposition 8 made the difference in the election, which is the claim here, right? You just don't know whether that's right or not, correct? I don't. Okay. I mean, I think it's fair to say that if they definitely, well, they said it, they said it definitely made the difference, then I would have a lot of reservations about that, <clears> given <throat> that there's no basis for proof that I've seen. I mean, no polling data, uh, survey data that said, why did you vote for Proposition 8? Are you aware of the polling, polling data as to why people voted for Proposition 8? No, I haven't, uh, I haven't seen any extensive polling data on that. So you no. haven't seen any extensive. Let me ask you whether you've seen any polling data on why people voted for Proposition 8? I'm trying to think. Um, I certainly have seen the exit polls about the vote, but I can't recall reading a poll that, uh, that said, why did you vote for Proposition 8? I mean, a large poll on that. No, you just put in a large poll. I will get to whether the poll is extensive. I will get to whether the poll was large. But what I'm asking you is whether you have seen any data at all as to why people voted for Proposition 8. I actually think I may have, but I don't recall what it is, yeah. You may recall? Yes. All right, well, let me ask you to look at tab 78. And as you do that, Mr. Boys, let me ask about how you're going in your examination of this witness. If you can tell, it's rather warm in here, and. Our landlord shuts down the ventilation at 5 o'clock. <laughs> Your Honor, I will not finish by 5 o'clock, and this would be a convenient time to break. Very well, then. Let's do it. We'll resume at 8.30 tomorrow morning.